Thanks be to God. Amen. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to thank Tim for leading in worship with me and Kat as well. I want to thank everyone in our wonderful music ministry, particularly our guest instrumentalists. Thank you so much. I want to express gratitude for all of the people uh, who are connecting us online in worship, our camera crews, our tech team, uh, Paul and Allie, everyone who's making that possible. Thank you so much. I also want to say a very special word of appreciation to the huge community of volunteers who participated, not only in today's celebration, the ushers, the greeters, the setup teams, the security folks, the beignet bus, all of the people who are in the second and first floors of the children's wing, making sure that it was decorated and amazing. Would you express a round of applause to share in the appreciation for all of those people? For all of the people who have found a home and service here at this church, God bless you and I thank you. My name is Lance Marshall, one of the senior pastors here at First Church, and we're in a sermon series right now in the season of Lent. Lent is the season of 40 days, not including Sundays, that immediately precede Easter Sunday. And it's a time of reflection. It's a time of introspection. It's a time of finding where it is that Christ is meeting us today. And, and that's a really important key point. I mean, focusing on the concept of struggles and stumbling blocks, because all of us, of course, face struggles and stumbling blocks in our life of faith. And we've been exploring over the season of Lent how it is that we can take common stumbling blocks, that when struggles that we all face, and through Christ's grace, experience those turning into the stepping stones of a much more solid and resilient and hope-filled life of faith. Last week, we talked about the struggle and the stumbling block of resentment what it is to be so angry, maybe at somebody or even worse, on behalf of somebody else, and to struggle with forgiveness, to struggle with understanding, to bear those wounds so deeply that they just cut and recut over time. And helping you explore that, both Tim and I looked at a parable that Jesus gave, and it's typically called the parable of the prodigal son. Again, what Mr. Mark referenced, someone who goes out and spins so extravagantly and wastefully, but Jesus introduces that as the story of a man who has two sons. That parable has two sons in it. And so last week we did the interesting thing of focusing on the parable of the prodigal son, almost entirely focusing on that older brother and the resentment that he harbored and what it was for him to experience a journey from resentment into love and how the key component of that was compassion. Particularly learning how to model the compassion that he had received and seen from his compassionate father. There's a huge lesson there for us in that story. We, we very seldom read that parable with a focus on that brother. That's exactly what we're doing with today's scripture. This is a scripture reading that comes to us from the Gospel of John. And it takes place chronologically very soon, not far away from when Jesus is going to experience the crucifixion and death and the resurrection. And he's having this intimate meal and an amazing moment happens. Someone who loves him, one of his followers, take this, takes this extravagant gift, three quarters of a pound of pure nard. Y'all, I don't have to tell you how hard it is to get three quarters of a pound of nard. <laughs> we all know. I mean, it's truly extravagant. And someone in her station would have had almost no way to access something like that. And yet she has it. And she uses all of it for the anointing, for the worship of Christ Jesus, her Lord, who she loves so much. It's an amazing story about sacrifice and giving and placing Christ first in all things and with everything that we have. It's an amazing story. But I want to focus instead on the character of Judas Iscariot in this story. That's who we're focusing on today. And as a rule of thumb, when we're reading scripture together, and when I'm teaching Bible study or I'm leading small groups, and we encounter people in scripture who are behaving in ways that are obviously not pleasing to God, that are being violent towards others or hateful towards others or exclusionary towards others, when we're seeing people like the Pharisees who are constantly trying to catch Jesus in his words or undermine his teachings, or when we're seeing someone like Judas Iscariot at their worst, one of our temptations is to say, thank you, O Lord, that I'm not like them. Thank you, O oh Lord, that I would never do something like that, that I would never stoop so low. I would never do something as evil as steal from the common purse of the disciples of Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, not me, never. It's easy for us to discount them and to say something like that is not applicable to us at all, but it's so much more powerful to pause and reflect and say, is there anything in their story that can teach us today? Is there anything in their journey towards faith that can strengthen us today? Is there any lesson that we can learn from them today? 
Is there any lesson that we, good people in Tarrant County, in the year 2022, can learn from Judas Iscariot? We, of course, know where Judas Iscariot's story leads. He's the one who ultimately conspires to turn Jesus over to the authorities that would have him killed. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. He does so, and then his heart is broken, and he ends up dead. His story is so brutal, it's so awful, it's so heartbreaking for one particular reason. It didn't have to be that way. The story of Jesus is always headed toward the cross, but Judas' story did not have to go that way, I think. He was right there with Jesus. He was following Jesus. He was hearing Jesus. He was witnessing the miraculous works. He was seeing the healing. He was seeing Lazarus raised from the dead. He was seeing the loaves and the fishes multiplied. He was seeing all of it. And yet, his story still leads to thievery and doubt and betrayal. Why? At this moment, in the moment of witnessing one of the most extravagant acts of worship that has ever happened, Judas, who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, speaks up and said, why in the world would you do that? That could have been given to the poor. And while Jesus answers back very excellently, helping us understand how extravagant worship is not at the expense of caring for the least and the last and the lost, it doesn't even matter to Judas because that's not what he actually cares about. Because everything he's saying is coming from a heart of insincerity. Anybody ever experienced something like that? Anybody ever experienced a super religious person like that? Thank God it never happens anymore. <laughs> Everything he's saying comes from a heart of insincerity. And what's heartbreaking is that it didn't have to. When I'm teaching people how to have a faith, how to have a relationship with Christ that actually changes their lives, that transforms them into the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and goes to bed at night and in the middle has nothing to hide and nothing to fear and nothing to lose. When I'm trying to teach people how it is to have a real and powerful and life-changing faith like that, one of the key lessons that I always teach is that Christ meets you where you actually are. Christ does not meet the future perfect you. Christ does not meet the all clinged up and pretty and on your best behavior, you. Christ always meets you where you actually are in life, with how you're actually hurting, where you're actually struggling, and with what you actually need. And the heartbreaking reality of Judas Iscariot is that he's still hiding from the Jesus who's right in front of him. He's stealing He's stealing from the community of people when he's seen that the person that he's with has power over life and death, can multiply loaves and fishes, can meet any need, and yet he's stealing because in his heart he still doesn't believe that Jesus will provide. He's still struggling with faith. He's still struggling with doubt. He's still struggling with hurts. And the one person who could actually help him with that is right in front of him and he won't be honest with him. Judas will not go to Jesus and say, I'm still struggling to believe. I'm still struggling to accept that you are who you say you are. I'm still trying with everything I have and I'm not getting there. And the one person who could actually help him, who could hear him, who could know his heart and understand him is right there. And Judas is still hiding from him. Judas sees Jesus do these works. He hears Jesus' proclamation of what the kingdom is actually like. And Judas gives up on him. So full of anger and doubt that he betrays Jesus because he's not the kind of Messiah that he was hoping for. He was hoping for a conquering king with a sword and an army. And instead, he gets someone who turns the other cheek. And he's so furious, he gives up. When what he could have done instead is reach out to Christ, his Lord, our Savior, right there in front of him and said, I am hurting so much and doubting so strongly and still struggling. What do you have to say to me? Let me ask you, do you think Jesus would have rejected him? I don't. Do you think Jesus would have given up on him? I don't. 
Do you think Jesus would have turned him away and said, well, when you get your act together, then you can rejoin us? No. I don't either. You're like my favorite church attendee <laughs> I've ever had. No. He would have accepted him and hugged him and healed him and met him where he actually was in the midst of his doubt. And he is insincere because he's not being honest with Jesus about where he actually is and how he's actually struggling. I don't know if he's embarrassed or if he feared rejection or what it is, but at the end of the day, he's hiding from Christ. And sometimes, so are we. And that's what we have to learn from Judas today.